Zechariah chapter 10, last time we were together, we wrapped up chapter 9, which was really, really, really good. And we'll continue to get into this, but the prophets are so rich, and particularly here in, in Zechariah. One of the things I will point out in review last time moving into this, um, we saw a lot of scripture that was speaking towards the, the ministry of Messiah, both his first advent and his second. In fact, um, between verses 9 and 10 of chapter 9, um, in between those two verses is about 2,000 years between his first event and his second, 2,000 plus. Let's go back and look at it. Chapter 9 of, uh, verse 9 of chapter 9 says, rejoice greatly. This is familiar to you, by the way, from the Christmas story. Uh, the, the, yeah, the uh, resurrection, the crucifixion resurrection story. But rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt. And my daughter asked me what lowly meant this week. There was a song, um, and it sounded like it was saying Jesus was lonely, but it was saying he was lowly. <laughs> so we had a whole conversation about it. Um, and, and we know and understand that that's the Lord coming in humility and, and peace, if I should say, in peace, um, to present himself as Messiah and King but he was rejected, we know that. Um, he was weeping because he knew that they were rejecting him as a nation and that because of that, destruction was gonna come, which happened in AD 70, we know that. But notice in verse 10, he says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim um, and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bows shall be cut off. And we're gonna see this again in, in chapter 10. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That speaks of his second event when he's coming back, Revelation chapter 19, um, in judgment and destruction of those who have rejected him and, and uh, persecuted his people. And then he will establish his kingdom forever. And so we see both sides of this. And often, as I've told you before, the prophets are this way, even in Isaiah uh, there's, a, there's a section of Isaiah where he's prophesying about the, the, the first part of, of, of the, the ministry of the Lord. In fact, Jesus quotes it in the Gospels. Many of you not if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so Jesus quotes the part, and in the middle of the verse, there's a comma, because the second part of the verse actually speaks of what he does when he returns the second time in judgment. So he comes, but in his coming, there's these two parts. There's this first coming uh, to present himself as Messiah and King and really to fulfill the law by dying on the cross and paying for sin uh, and then uh, rising on the third day um, to establish uh, salvation and resurrection and then to return the second time to bring judgment and then establish his everlasting kingdom. And so it's beautiful to think of it in those two ways. And so we saw all of that. And then as we went down in... Um, uh, verses 10 down through verse 13 of that chapter, we saw that he was proclaiming that peace. And then finally, we wrap up the chapter all just speaking of what the Messiah would, would fulfill in all of his ministry. Now we go into chapter 10. And then in chapter 10, we begin to, he begins to speak of it again, dealing with some of the things that are necessary to be done um, as far as the, the false shepherds of Israel who didn't fulfill their ministry of leading the people in truth. And he's going to speak on that and his anger towards that. And then he's going to, again, speak of his restoration for the nation in the last days. So let's read. We'll come back and pray and then we'll dive in. Verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1. Please say amen if you're there. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. And the Lord will make, notice, flashing clouds. And he will give them showers of rain, grass in the field, for everyone. For the idols speak delusion. The diviners or the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wean their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds, for the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, 
the house of Judah and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. From him comes the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them. And the riders on horses shall be put to shame. I will strengthen the house of Judah and will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside, for I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. Those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as if with wine, as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them for I will redeem them and they shall increase as they once increased. I will sow them among the peoples and they shall remember me as uh, remember me notice in far countries they shall live together with their children and they shall return. I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria and will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them. He shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up. Then the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. So I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk, excuse me, shall walk up and down in his name, says the Lord. And so, Father, we do thank you tonight, and we pray that you would open your scripture to us, Lord God, that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit, that you would um, cause us to focus on what you would say, and, uh, Lord, to put all of the things of this life that we've dealt with this week, whether work or school, as you've called us to occupy until you come, Lord, but help us now to set it all aside uh, and just to hear what you would say. And I pray that you would refresh and restore us tonight, Lord that we would be ready for the work that's ahead the rest of this week until we gather together again in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And so one of the first things that we're going to see is this kind of uh, um, this, I should say restoration. I'll start there in, in verse one where he talks about rain. Look at it with me. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of latter rain And the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Um, A beautiful verse when you begin to think about it, because in ancient times, they really didn't have what we would call a uh, an irrigation system. You know, it's amazing when you go into other countries and you see even even how things work. And 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 we complain about uh, life here in America. And then you you go and you see um, bamboo gutters trying to take water away and. You know, people who don't necessarily have running water of sometimes plumbing and and sewage systems and all this kind of stuff. So it's very interesting. But even from an agricultural standpoint, they didn't have an irrigation system. So they relied on rain, the former rains that would come and then the latter rains that would come to uh, water their crop. And so they were kind of dependent upon that. So for them, as he he speaks this, it makes perfect sense to them. Um, It's dry, it's dusty, it's, it's barren in a sense because of all that's going on. And he simply says, ask the Lord for rain, which I think um, speaks in itself to the fact that one of the things that Israel failed to do is just repent and call upon the Lord and ask him for restoration. They kept trying, which we're going to see in a minute. They kept trying to do it themselves. They kept trying to figure it out themselves. They kept looking for other things. They kept turning to other nations for support and all this kind of stuff. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, And sometimes that's the issue. We see that over and over and over with them. And when you read through the prophets, what you actually hear is the voice of the Lord crying out to them, turn to me, return to me, and I'll restore you and I'll meet you and I'll, I'll lift you up. 
but they fail to actually do that. And we do the same thing in our lives, man. We can try to do it all ourselves, figure it all out ourselves and, and, and work, our, work our knuckles bare trying to figure this life out. And the one thing I've come to realize is that the true peace, the true joy, the real restoration takes place when you stop and you call on the Lord and you wait on the Lord. And he's the one that restores us. Now, prophetically, this is kind of speaking of the fact that they would be in the latter season of Israel's prophetic existence, they would receive restoration like the latter rains. Those latter rains that they would wait for that would come at the end of the season, which would refresh all of the vegetation. And they needed that because without it, they would lose much of their crop. And, and so likewise, just like they understood the latter rains, God is simply saying in latter times, I'm going to cause you to flourish uh, like you never have before. It's going to be beautiful, you know, and, 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 and this speaks of the fact that God plans to restore them. We know he did it once when he brought them back after 70 years of exile in Babylon. We know that, right? Um, and he caused them to flourish to some degree, but they were still under the rule of other nations. But then there would be a final prophetic time when he would bring them back and what the Bible calls the latter days, the last times, and he would restore them. And in that restoration, he's going to come to bring them into the ultimate restoration of eternal kingdom there in Jerusalem, a literal kingdom. Y'all remember, we've talked about that over and over and over. Well, we're in those latter times because Israel is, is back in the land, which is beautiful for us to see and be able to, to behold what God is planning to do with them. Um, so he says, ask the Lord for rain in the time of latter rains. And notice it says here, and the Lord will make flashing clouds. It's interesting to think about this you know, I am amazed growing up in, you know, kind of like rural area, farm country, things are different, you know, and I noticed life has got away from me. And so I don't see what I used to see. Like it used to be where you look up in the sky at night and it's clear, you see stars. And sometimes now so many lights, you know, you don't, it's, life is so busy, you don't see stars anymore. We don't take time to see them. Um, but also one of the interesting things is you can see rain coming from afar off when you're in like farm country and you can, you can see, and, and it could just come up sometimes really fast, especially in certain seasons of the year, um, because the Lord has the power to do it. He, he sent uh, Elijah, Elijah and, and said to Ahag, the king, hey, ain't gonna be no rain for this amount of time. You know, and then when it was time, he would come back and prophesy that rain actually came. In other words, the Lord has the power. He created the, 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 all of the, the creation and how it all works together, which is amazing. Everything that goes on. I didn't study it to talk about it tonight, but you go study the power of the system of rain, how, you know, it evaporates from one location, is caught and carried by the clouds and stuff happens and then lightning strikes and releases nitrogen and everything gets what it needs. And, and it seems to be a system that we can't even fathom. The angels even involved in this system of watering the earth. Can you imagine that? And there's a drought or something like that. And he simply says, ask, and the Lord has the supernatural ability to make flashing clouds out of nothing and cause rain to come. We take rain for granted. He has that power to restore. They never would call upon him for full restoration. That one day they will. We're going to see that here in the book of Zechariah. And he will give them showers of rain, flashing clouds and showers of rain. The Lord will make it just come upon them in the season that he has prepared for them. And notice grass in the field for everyone. We don't think of grass as meaning anything, but it speaks of the vegetation of the fields, the, the, the wheat, the grain. In other words, in man's economy, man doesn't always have enough. We understand that and they struggle, but he will make it so it's abundant notice for everyone. You catch that? Because in the final restoration, that's the way it'll be. It'll be an abundance and everybody will be blessed. And so the Lord will bring uh, flashing clouds and showers of rain and an abundant work for everyone because when the Lord restores, he fully restores. Um, he, brings, he brings to a full prosperity. Israel will see this one day. And I, I love this. But again, for, for you tonight, if you are dry, if you are struggling, you can call upon the Lord. You can repent and God can restore you in your soul. I'm not here with some false prosperity message. I'm saying what needs to happen happens. It starts right here. Amen. It starts with a, a, uh, a cleansing 
And then there's a, there's, a, there's a replacement, if you will, of joy. There's an overwhelming peace that comes forth from the Lord. Times of refreshing, uh, Peter said in Acts chapter 3. And so this is what the Lord is planning for them ultimately, and we are going to see it. You know, the thing is, he's been in the process now for 150 years of bringing them back into this latter day restoration where he's preparing them for something. In the 1800s, I've told you this before, um, the, the Zionist movement began. We're going to see how it happened when we get down to, uh, to verse 8. I don't want to get ahead how it, how it began, but he's been drawing them back, drawing them back, drawing them back. Um, and then for the last 70 years, he's been restoring the nation, pre- preparing the nation to, uh, for this final thing that they're going to see when he returns uh, to them and, and he uh, brings in an everlasting kingdom. Now, verse 2 um, before I go to verse two, though, I want to just kind of back up because one of the things that this, this rain kind of speaks of is really, even for Israel, we see it for ourselves, but for Israel is really, um, the Holy spirit inhabiting the nation, um, which is something that they've been, if you will, blind, uh, for now. But if we look in scripture and I got a few verses for the screen, but we're going to turn a little bit tonight. But in the book of Isaiah, we see that. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 14 through 15. Um, 15 is where I want to go, but it says on the screen, it says, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be des- uh, deserted, uh, the forts and the towers will become lias forever, uh, a, j- a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. That's when it would be desolate. Until, notice verse 15, the spirit is poured upon us from on high. And the wilderness becomes fruit, a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a farce. And this is the picture Isaiah had of this restoration. And of course, in the time that we're living in, they're being prepared for that. The land of Israel is flourishing, but God has more for them. In Isaiah 44, verse 3 and 4 on the screen also, it says, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants. This is speaking to Israel and my blessings on your offspring. They will spring up among the grass like willows by uh, the water courses. In other words, he's planning to pour his spirit out upon the nation of Israel to give them a, um, a living heart, if you will. And so this is his desire. And I keep pointing to this because one of the things that has been really horrible in theology is that when there was no Israel, many of the uh, those who wrote commentary, those who, uh, who taught theology over the past 2,000 years have written Israel off and spiritualized those scriptures to, uh, to say that they are fulfilled in the church. And, and sometimes you can see hints of why they may do that because if you looked at Joel chapter 2, Joel talks about God pouring his spirit out in the last days and Peter quotes it in Acts chapter 2. Y'all remember that? Um, And so there's a partial, if you will, fulfillment in the church in that we know we're in the last days and God has poured his spirit out uh, upon all flesh to that degree. But then when we go into the kingdom, he will he's going to do that upon the nation of Israel. So it's beautiful. So it speaks of his spirit being poured out and we've received his spirit as the church, but we do not replace Israel. Amen. However, we see this kind of a first fruit, if you will. The spirit has been poured out upon the church over and over and over for the last 2,000 years as movements would happen of the spirit and and things of that sort. And so we're so thankful for that. Um, Looking forward to seeing even more revival. But right now, let it just start here. You know, let it let the spirit be poured out anew on you. But and and you can do that by simply saying to to the Lord. I know that I am not filled in the sense of with the flowing of your spirit in my life. I'm dry. I'm not glorifying you. My life is mundane. All I'm doing is getting up and going to work and coming home. (laughs) And I'm not saying that's all of you. No, I pray it's not. I pray it's a very few. But if that is you, be honest with the Lord. Say, Lord, I need need you to do something in my life. I want to experience your presence in my life on a daily basis. I want to hear you speak to me, Lord, to restore my soul, and the Lord will do that to you. All right, so let's continue. Now, we're going to kind of look at a cleansing, if you will, that's going to take place as we look at verses 2 and 3. It begins, notice verse 2, for the idols 
speak delusion, the diviners or the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people winged their way like sheep. They are in trouble. Why? Because there is no shepherd. And he's going to get at the fact that the shepherds are, if you will, going to receive false instruction. Now, I want to first start with this word I, idol is interesting. It's um, teraphim, if you will, or, or teraphim is the way it's actually pronounced. Um, and it's used seven times as image is translated, seven times, uh, six times as teraphim, one time as idol, one time as idolatry. It's defined in one way as a demonic god, uh, excuse me, a domestic god, and in another way as an image. So either way, it refers to false gods, if you will, and the image of such. And of course, we know that these false gods are these fallen angels, these demon demonic entities, because when you offer or worship idols, you're worshiping the demon spirit behind the idol. We understand that. Amen. We know that. All right. So in other words, this is fallen angels, which actually lead man in worship of itself. I actually believe that these little gods, if you will, these fallen angels actually pride themselves in being able to manipulate humans, humanity to some degree into worshiping them and bowing to their images. And so this is something that's rampant in the time that Jesus came in the Old Testament. And even today in different ways, it just gets repackaged, repackaged, repackaged. Um, but this is what they're doing. Um, the practice of sexual immorality is just the, the, the same repackaging of Babylonian and ancient gods um, that they were worshiping back then. And so when we think about, um, say, for instance, the LGBTQ movement, that's just a repackaging of this demonic activity of sexual immorality, which is a mockery of God and his creation. And those who practice such things are actually, if you will, bowing to these false gods, these demonic entities um, that are manipulating them behind the scenes. And, and so that's exactly what they're doing. And they take joy in getting God's creation to actually bow to and worship their images. And that's what pornography is. That's what sexual immorality is. That's what the illicit use of drugs is. That's what violence is all about. Um, plan on man's sinful nature to cause man to, to uh, dishonor God. And so these, these diviners, if you look at the verse again, so for idols speak delusions. Well, idols don't speak. So when we think about these wooden idols, I think the first place the word is used is when um, Jacob is leaving Naaman and uh, with his wife, uh, was it Rachel that hid the, 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 the little idol she stole from her dad? Y'all remember that? That's the first place. So we think about these little wooden or stone images, but they don't speak, do they? In fact, God mocks them. They have hands, they have eyes, but they can't see, they have mouth, but they can't speak. So it's the, it's, the, it's the fallen angel behind them. So they're manipulating this story and they're speaking delusion. I like that because it clears some things up for us. That means that all deception, all confusion um, that's in the world today from a social standpoint, standpoint from a political standpoint, standpoint um, in science, in the medical arena, uh, through technology, all of this delusion, all of this deception is demonic activity that's being uh, unleashed in this time that we live in, these last days, to bring confusion and deception to the world. So idols, wooden images don't speak, but the falling ones behind them speak. The, div diviners, the diviners, or the, they, what they are is the human element now. And they, listen, they consult these spirits of these idols in order to predict the future. So in other words, what he's saying is these these diviners these you know what they do is they consult these spirits and people come to them to get insight into future events or things behind the scene so now that brings in all of your stuff right you can get into all of the um uh whatever you want to call it palm readers tarot card readers um psychics yeah all of that kind of stuff um and, and to some degree psychology falls into this stuff as well false false knowledge philosophy falls into this as well um, because psychology and philosophy takes you away from bi biblical truth we've talked about that before so they go to all of this to to get information but what they, they envision lies what they're being told what they're being given is lies um, and so and they tell false dreams 
And so therefore, he says here, they comfort then in vain. Okay? And, and, and it, the issue is, he says, therefore, the people waned their way like sheep going astray is what he's, in, in, he's saying. Why? They're in trouble. Check this out. They're in trouble because there is no shepherd. And this is the problem. When Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved in his spirit because he saw them like sheep having no shepherd. So the people, and I think we should take this serious. People, people, um, I just looked at the clock. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm actually coming in for a landing without going too far. Y'all got to let me cover some of this. Um, but God's heart is that people would be guided according to his word and his truth. He always desires that. That's what he desired for Israel. But what we find, and this is if we go on, verse 3, it says, My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds, for the Lord of hosts will visit his flock. So in other words, he's coming to visit his flock, but he's going to punish the shepherds. What shepherds? Well, I mean, we could look at it from the priests and even the sects that came out the, in, in the sense of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all of these religious leaders that Jesus encountered who, and the scribes, all of them who wanted to destroy Jesus um, because they were false shepherds and they were, if you will, being, be, be, being made wealthy on the people and all of this kind of stuff. They were taking advantage of them, but they were not shepherding them. They were not saying, thus says the Lord. Or let's go to the word. Let me open the word and show you what it says about the things that are going on in the times that we're living in. And here's how we need to turn our hearts to him. Here's how we need to worship him. They were not doing that. So he says here um, that he's going to punish those shepherds because the Lord of hosts will visit his flock. So when he gets back, look, they plan, they plan games, but the Lord is coming back to settle the account. Amen. Um, he's going to visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. I like that. In other words, he's going to show up and make them like stallions and a royal army. He's going to turn them into some fierce, if you will, war machine in a sense. You know, he's going to do something. Um, from him comes notice. Verse four is beautiful. I want to spend a moment there at least because I'm running out of time. But it says here, from him, the Lord comes the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. Now, there's a lot of things being mentioned in here, but from him, these images are, are there. From him first comes the cornerstone. Well, we already know who the cornerstone is. Jesus, amen. We see that if you're taking notes. Let me give you some verses to go look at in your own time. But Isaiah 28, 16 talks about Jesus, uh, the, the Messiah being the cornerstone. Psalm 118, which is a Messianic Psalm, verses 22 to 23, speaks of him as the cornerstone. Matthew 21, 42 speaks of Jesus as the cornerstone. Um, Acts chapter 4, verse 11, the one we know in reference a few weeks ago, 1 Peter 2 Chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, that, that um, talks about him being the chief cornerstone, the stone um, which the builders rejected, the, the religious leaders rejected him. Y'all remember that? Has become the chief cornerstone. And so he's referencing the coming Messiah. From him comes the cornerstone, the tent peg even, um, which is also mentioned in Isaiah 22, verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 20. 3 through 24. I was going to have y'all turn to, the, to all of these tonight, but we don't have time. Speaks of a, him being a tent peg. In other words, he's holding up, up, if you will, the tent. So the whole thing is held up by him, which means that he's not only the foundation, he's the cornerstone, but he's holding the whole thing together. Isn't that good? Um, he, uh, from him, the battle bow, he is the warrior. He is the, the one who will come and he will judge and he will go out and battle. Um, in fact, we can see that in Isaiah 63, Verses one through four speaks of when Jesus returns and he comes from the east and his garments are, are dyed red because of the blood of the battle that he's in and he's doing it all by himself. And then Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16 speaks of the Lord's return and the Lord waging war and speaking with the sharp two-edged sword is the imagery of his word being the powerful word of God and he slays the enemy himself as he returns. And it says here, and from him, every ruler together. And we see that as well um, as he comes back. Revelation 19, verse 16. 
um, all rulers will be submitted to him and he will establish his own kingdom. And so we have this this picture of the Lord wanting res to restore in the end like the rains. He's going to punish and cleanse out the place, if you will, from all of the demonic activity that, and, and that the shepherds who were supposed to shepherd his people were involved in. And then we see from him then will be the foundation and the house and he will control all rulers. He himself will fight for Israel. Verse five, we've got to move on a little bit. Verse five says, um, they shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle, which is amazing. Um, he's going to turn Israel in, into this, this, if you will, they shall fight because the Lord is with them. That's why. Amen. Now, pause for a moment because we got to we got to at least consider these things for ourselves. You know, for me, the Lord is my foundation. He holds my life together. And spiritual warfare is real. And I'm victorious because he is with me, you know. And these, these same truths go to all believers for all times. But, but why? Well, verse 6 says, I will strengthen the house of Judah. Isn't that beautiful? I will strengthen the house of Judah. And I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back. How many times have we heard that? I will bring them back. And they are back now. Um, and I like that. I will strengthen them. They're going to be strong, not because they have any, any, anything in them, but because he's with them. Um, and this is, this is what's needed to be strong. In the New Testament, we're told, Ephesians chapter 6, as Paul is about to talk about spiritual warfare, he says, and be uh, strong in the power of his might. Y'all remember that? And, and, and really, we who are believers today filled with the Holy Spirit, we are strong and we do operate in the power of his might because he is with us. Isn't that good news? Man, I, I just think that's amazing. I don't have to go out by myself. I don't have to stand here before you by myself. I don't have to go out and evangelize by myself. I don't have to be a father by myself. I don't have to do anything by myself because the Lord is with me and my strength comes from him. And this is all that's necessary. Let's, let's move on. Um, so he, I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside. In other words, when he's done restoring them, it's going to be like nothing, nothing ever happened to them, you know. Uh, and by the way, there is no nation that's ever been completely exiled, completely, and come back together. Um, for I am the Lord, their God, and I will hear them. Those of Ephraim, he says, shall be like a mighty man and their heart shall rejoice as if with wine. The imagery is not that they will be drunk with wine, but their heart will be merry in that way. Isn't that amazing? We're told the same thing in the New Testament. Be no longer drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes being filled with the Holy Spirit, it, it resembles not in a bad way, but in a good way, just being merry. Right. We're, we're excited. You see people come to the door. They're so happy to get to church and they just smiling and, and whatnot. And, and, uh, and if you knew them before they were saved, it wouldn't have looked like that unless they had wine in them. You know, <laughs> um, yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. Notice what he says here. I will whistle for them and gather them. I like when God says stuff like that. He said that in the book of Isaiah, if you remember, um, I will whistle, but he was whistling for judgment and calling another nation. But here he says, I will whistle for them and gather them. The image here is just as we think of it, the way you might whistle for your pet dog. Um, you can even do that with horses. Um, if you train them right, <laughs> at least Zorro could. Um, but you think about whistling for your pet and your pet comes, you know? Yeah, because, because they have a relationship. You've trained them. They know you. They know your voice. And so you whistle and they come to you. I used to see this stuff back in the day with hunting dogs. It's a crazy thing. These hunters have these dogs, right? And because I don't know flocks of sheep, so I have to talk about what I understand. So I see these hunting dogs with these, with these different types of uh, hounds and beagles and stuff. And they can be several hunters together. They show up with their pickup trucks. They let their, their dogs out of these little things in the back, these little cages. And these, so it's like, you know, a bunch of dogs. They're about to go on a rabbit hunt or a deer hunt. And a, and a hunter can make some crazy, stupid sound, and his dogs take off with him. And the other hunter can go that way with his dogs. How do they do that? Because his dogs know his sound. They can be playing with the other dogs, but when he makes his little sound, you know, and I started to try it, but I can't do it. My dad used to do it. <laughs> 
and the dogs would come follow him. It's amazing how that works. And God uses this imagery to speak something to us. I will whistle for them and gather them. This speaks of God's sovereign ability to supernaturally speak into the heart of people and cause them to move according to his will. In other words, God is saying, hey, there's going to come a time when I'm going to whistle and my people are going to go home. And for 150 years, it's been going on. Jews don't even know how to explain to you why they want to go live in Jerusalem. They want to go, they want to all pack into this land that's not even, is barely as big as New Jersey. Not, not even half the size of, of North Carolina. They want to all pack into that crazy land with Palestinians shooting missiles and Iran threatening them every day. And they all going, getting off the plane, kissing the ground, going back to Israel. Why would you do that? That makes no sense. But he whistled. I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a picture he's given to us. Whether he actually whistled or not, I don't know. But it's, it's telling us that he, he decided to call them home. Now they're going home. That's why. We've, we've witnessed this. You know, Jesus says that the generation that would, would, would see this would by no means pass off the scene. And so, you know, we get all caught up in trying to calculate generations then. Because <laughs> it's been 70 years now since they've been a nation. Um, but I believe it's genos in the Greek means a people group. Um, this ethnic group, this people now, will by no means ever pass away until it's done. So that's it for Israel. Israel will never be exiled again. They will, they will never be destroyed. They're back in the land. This is it. There's no other time coming. Prophetically, we've seen him restore them. So now we look at what we see in the world and the birth pains are happening like crazy, y'all. I don't know if you, it, it's like, you know, with birth pains, they begin to pick up in intensity. We've seen the wars and rumors of war. It, look, the birth pain in the last three years have intensified at, at the curve was going like this, but then now it's going like that a little bit. Um, because the, of the wars and the rumors of wars that we see now, not just with, um, you know, North Korea, you know, being silly in Iran, but, you know, Ukraine and um, China posturing and everybody's, every, it's just tense. So the rumors of wars are every, are every day, um, plus the wars that we see. Um, pestilence and famine, hunger. Um, you can go do your own research. I don't have time. I'm running out of time. Hunger is increasing. Um, we're Americans, so even if you don't think you're rich, you're rich according to world standards, okay? Um, but hunger is, is increasing because the cost of food is increasing because we live in the world system that doesn't know how to, through the love of God, just feed everybody because we have the ability to do it. Hunger is increasing, which, the, which Jesus said would happen, uh, as well as plagues. Um, we're, we're concerned about so many more um, plagues and, and, and viruses and things of that sort. Coronavirus is just a plague, a birth pain, if you will. Um, so anyway, those are the things that we see happening uh, in these last times. And so he says, for I will redeem them and they shall increase as they once increased. So in other words, it'll be just like they had never been cast out. They will increase like they once increased. In other words, they're going to flourish and they're flourishing. And we'll continue to flourish until the Lord comes and establishes his kingdom. Um, because Ezekiel showed us how he's going to supernaturally protect them. Almost done. Verse 9. I'll probably have to stop here. Um, I will sow them among the peoples and they shall remember me in far countries. They shall live. Now, this is back and forth. He, he kind of now goes back to when they were scattered. Um, I will sow them among among the peoples. In other words, I'm going to cast them out in all the nations. That happened in AD 70 when Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. Um, several hundred thousand Jews were killed. The rest went into exile, captivity, or if you will, into all the nations. Um, so he's going to sow them in that way. But then notice what he says. And they shall remember me as in far countries. They shall live. In other words, even when the Jews were scattered around the world, they never forgot. Now, they may not be all Orthodox Jews practicing and following their God, but they never forgot and they never, they never fully turned. In fact, just this week, they celebrated Monday and Tuesday, the Feast of Purim, remembering when God saved them when they were about to be destroyed in the book of Esther. Y'all remember that? And um, 
if I get the names right, Haman had plotted to, um, to hang Mordecai and, you know, get the Jews destroyed. And so God calls the king to not be able to sleep and to call for the chronicles. And in the process of that, he realized, hey, yeah, that, that Jew Mordecai helped me out. I need to, I need to, I need to, you know, honor him and ended up honoring him and promoting him. And y'all know the story, um, which is beautiful. From that, we understand the Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. Amen. And so, you know, they, they remember how the Lord supernatural. They never forgot their God fully. And, and so we all these things that they continue to practice Passover and all this stuff that they know and remember, even in, even in these other countries, they did this. And they shall live together with their children. And then he says, and they shall what? It's a miracle that they went all over the world while Jerusalem lay desolate. Then he whistled. <laughs> he whistled in the 1800s and stuff. They started going home. And then when, the, when Satan saw that, he said, well, we got to put a stop to this. And the next thing you know, he's got Hitler, who was a nobody until Satan used him as an antichrist figure and, and, and empowered him to speak and rally people and they destroyed millions of them trying to shut the whole thing down and then the God prevailed and they became a nation, you know? And so here we are in the last days, but we got to end now. Um, so this is just beautiful to listen to how God is speaking and how he's spoken through the prophets and how we've seen so much of this already fulfilled, which encourages us to continue to look to what the word says about where things are going. Notice I didn't say, look to the news and the YouTube dudes. But look to what the word says about the way things are going to go. Because, the, because we, we already know the headlines given to us in advance. We know where this is headed. And so um, the good news with that is, if that's the case, then that means God is faithful. Amen. Which means that everything he's promised is coming. Amen. And, uh, and that's what we rest in. Let's, let's pray. Bow your heads. Father, help us to be faithful to you and to remember your promises. Lord, let us not grow weary while well-doing, Lord God. Let us not lose heart. Let us not faint. I pray that you would give those who are weak tonight strength, that you would pour your spirit afresh upon us, Lord God, that you would continue to speak to us and lead us. Let your word be clear to us, Lord God, that we would be understanding and know how we should live in, in light of these things that you've already said to us, Lord God, in light of what we have in store, uh, Lord, that we will rule and reign with you and dwell with you for all eternity. Uh, Lord, it says that we will even judge the angels, Lord God. We don't even understand uh, the things that you have for us. The Bible says, eyes not seen nor is ear heard, Lord. So much laid ahead, Father. I pray that you would cause us to dwell upon that and meditate upon that, Lord God, and be encouraged. Um, give us strength for the time that we live in, Lord. Help us to finish our race and glorify you. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.